The dream of the radical opposition. How much does it cost to kill the president of Belarus? The price, obligations, and sponsors. We negotiated, sought funds in Ukraine, Israel, and the United States. Operation Elimination, under the name Silence. Shoot the president's helicopter during takeoff or landing with a heavy machine gun. What did the conspirators prepare for the president's assassin? The person who raises a hand against the head of state must be eliminated quickly and publicly. Where does Alexander Lukashenko hide his money? Speculations abroad. We believe there might be a reserve of money that the head of state could use in case of emergencies. Power on bayonets. What would happen after a possible victory? The full layout? Each was to receive control over one of the regions of Belarus. The fate of the president's supporters and his family through the eyes of the conspirators. That just means a bullet to the forehead. Civil war. Great bloodshed. Intervention. They were not afraid of casualties. And we believed there would be blood in any case. A direct and detailed response to all media insinuations. Was the murder of the Belarusian leader being prepared or not? A unique opportunity to hear all the nuances from the main organizer of the assassination attempt. Two years after the verdict. Tried, succeeded, didn't succeed. A deadly conspiracy. Target Lukashenko. Watch right now. April 2021, Moscow, Korchma, Tereshbulba. The Belarusian KGB conducts the final part of the operation to suppress an armed rebellion. After a detailed discussion of the plan to assassinate President Alexander Lukashenko, all participants in the conversation at Korchma are detained. The news about a group of people planning the physical elimination of Belarus's first person and a military takeover attracts the attention of all world media. We had a unique opportunity to talk with the person planning the bloody coup. Yuri Leonidovich, it's hard to recognize you. Is it really you? Yes, it's me. Three years have passed. Sports, diet, a slightly different lifestyle. So the figure has changed. Seriously changed? Yes. And was it really you in 2021 who intended to kill President Lukashenko? Yes. Our group had such intentions, but it turned out as it did. It turned out that we lost, and three of our people ended up in places, so to speak, not so distant. Tell us, what was this plan? Our group characterized it as a classic military coup. We often recalled the 1972 coup in Chile, the coup of Augusto Pinochet, when generals take power into their own hands and establish a military government. So everyone needs to unite against Lukashenko. Only his departure, by any means, well, in this case, we mean that these will probably be violent methods we can move from the point in general. I have another remark. So if the question arises, and it has already been raised, in fact, about In fact, to remove Lukashenko. Someone must give the people who will be doing this, well, in general, some justification. These people must receive from someone, well, not an order, probably, but, well, if we speak quite frankly, a sentence. How was it supposed to happen? Before dawn, the units participating in the rebellion were to leave their locations. Part of the forces was allocated to block the city of Minsk to prevent reinforcements from arriving. A tank battalion was supposed to reach Starshinsky town, block it, and take everyone there prisoner, or destroy them if they resisted. Why such attention to the president's residence in Astrashid? 
We had information that the head of state spends most of his time in Astrashid. Besides, we believed there might be a reserve of money there that the head of state could use in case of emergencies. Money was needed to settle with the military, so capturing Starshinsky town was crucial for us, because we needed money to pay the military. Other forces were to move towards the city center, capture the president's residence, seize the main media outlets, meaning on Komunistichskaya, on Makayonka. Occupy them so that representatives of the junta could address the people with a very simple message. Power is transferred to the military, with all demands to remain calm and perform their duties. Those who do not comply will deal with the army, meaning they will be arrested, or if they resist, destroyed on the spot. But there was another scenario. If the military refused to shoot at the head of state, radical groups were prepared, including the DSA OGSB group. who were ready to shoot down the head of state's helicopter during takeoff or landing with a heavy machine gun. The destruction of this helicopter was to be used as a signal for the military to act according to the plan I just described. Was there a discussion on how to deal with the people who executed this plan essentially killed the head of state? World history teaches that the person who raises a hand against the head of state must be eliminated quickly and publicly because anyone who comes to the head of state values their life. And a bad example is contagious. If one head of state can be eliminated, so can the next. Therefore, the quick and publicly known elimination of the person who raised a hand against the head of state should deter such crimes in the future. Tell me, how many covert groups did you have that you could deploy? There was a group of military personnel, and there was also a group conditionally called OGSB, Civil Self-Defense Units. They declared a strong desire to eliminate the head of our state. The silence plan was sent to me by DoGSB, a Ukrainian citizen. He lived in Germany in recent years, and I received this plan from him because he claimed they had some armed units in Belarus. Shooting the head of state's convoy with a grenade launcher. This was the silence plan. This plan was sent to me and I forwarded it to other group members. The plan was criticized and presented as another version of this plan. I always kept a certain distance from Disson personally, because he is a Ukrainian citizen for whom the lives of Belarusians really have no value. And he seemed to act in the interests of his country. Once in a conversation with me, Dis insisted that I come to Kyiv when I asked why, he said he was not authorized to tell me at the moment. But I should trust him and fly to Kiev. At Borisville Airport, they were supposed to put a bag over my head, take me to some institution or basement, and interrogate me with a lie detector. And if I passed the lie detector, they would tell me why I was brought to Kiev. Despite the attractiveness of such an offer, I decided to refuse it, because my life and freedom are more valuable than some strange games, apparently related to Ukrainian intelligence services, most likely. And who was behind DIS, it's hard for me to judge. At that time, there were so many both state and non-state private armed groups in Ukraine that it could have been anyone. Avtukovich is the author of the option to eliminate by shooting with a heavy machine gun at the helicopter during takeoff or landing. I turned to Avtukovich as a former military man. He said that it was quite difficult to do it with a grenade launcher, but he considered a machine gun a more reliable option. And what about Alexander Lukashenko's family? You considered the option, because after eliminating the first person, they would surely organize resistance in one way or another. What was their fate in your plan? Igor Makar was looking to buy a house in the Gomel region. 
In the basement, he planned to keep hostages to use in negotiations in case of an unsuccessful development of events. In particular, the name Nikolai Lukashenko was mentioned, who was also supposed to be held in this house and used in the process of bargaining, negotiations, conversations, pressure. Were you ready for a lot of bloodshed? We calculated various options and we believed there would be blood in any case. And from our point of view, a military coup was the only chance to correct the mistakes made by Tikhonovskaya and her people. Tried, succeeded, didn't succeed. At what point did you realize that radical actions, blood, were your only chance to come to power? I finally realized this in August 2020, when I visited Independence Square and saw the protests. I saw that the people gathered there were not capable of changing power. By that time, Alexander Lukashenko had gathered his supporters' security forces around him. Gathered, as they say, strength into one fist and for equal opposition, another fist was needed. Our group understood that only people in uniform could carry out a coup. Of all the groups of people in uniform in Belarus, the army undoubtedly has the greatest strength because no other force can oppose the army within the country. Moreover, we noticed that the army practically did not participate in the events of August 2020, from which a conclusion was drawn, which seemed logical at the time, that the army is not always loyal to the current head of state, and it might be possible to find people ready to take radical steps to carry out a military coup. There was confidence that such a group must exist somewhere in Belarus, and that certain efforts should be made to find them. Therefore, I actively sought a person connected with the army, and met such a person who expressed readiness to search for people for a military coup scenario on my assignment. But he needed certain funds for this, so I paid for his expenses from my pocket for his trips around Belarus to meet with officers in various garrisons. Today, we have come to the conclusion that elections do not decide anything. That is the base, yes, it played its role overslept after Sasha is full. But what is my significance now for Sasha's elimination? How many people were involved in the conspiracy? Can you list them? Maybe give a short description of each? Well, first of all, me, that's clear. Alexander Yuryevich Feduda, a well-known political scientist previously associated with the administration of the president of Belarus. At that moment when, for example, a bug is suddenly installed in my house and you say this, it will be a great reason to imprison me. I have a question in this regard, colleagues. Do you understand that after you announce all this, the game will be tough and bloody, and no one on the territory of Belarus will be able to publicly join this? Yegor Kostusev, head of the BNF party, to which I belonged at the time, come on Rigor, let's take down Luka together, and then we'll decide who will rule Belarus. In elections. If we decide who will be, then yes. Dmitry Shigelsky. This is a person who lives in New York, a former migrant from Belarus. He is a psychiatrist by education. As far as I know, he recently managed a pharmacy in New York City. Liberals like to say that violence is ineffective, but that's not true. Violence is effective. The question shouldn't be about Lukashenko leaving. The question should be, I'm ready to take power. I have a team to run the country when Lukashenko leaves, no matter how, whether he dies, is killed, flees, or is arrested. And yes, I want to seize power, because all politics, damn it, is about power, and nothing else. Then we invited Mr. Makarenko, who participated very briefly in our Zoom conferences, and withdrew himself. Igor Makar, who was recommended by DISOGSB, also known as Mr. Hoffman, a Ukrainian citizen. Our group also included Alexander Perepechko, a scientist, a specialist in authoritarian regimes. 
He prepared expert opinions, summaries, analyzed possible ways used in other countries to eliminate the current government, and what results it led to, which is most interesting. And Pavel Kulishenko, also known as X Oman, a blogger who was previously, as far as I know, a sergeant of an Oman company in one of the regional centers. Recently, he lived in New York City and was engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat training. This is the group that participated in our Zoom conferences. Again, what you're saying now smells like a civil war with a lot of blood. What role did Tikhonovskaya play in your plan? In January 2021, Svetlana Tikhonovskaya was offered to join our Zoom conference, and she agreed. Further negotiations were held with her to share funds. She mentioned an amount of about $100,000. She categorically refused to participate in Zoom conferences, as she believed she should maintain a distance from so-called radicals advocating bloody scenarios. She wanted to be only a purely political representative, holding meetings with European and American politicians, but at the same time bear no responsibility in case of failure. But technically, she joined the conspirators. Technically, she joined, was ready to share power, but was very afraid that in case of failure, her name would be mixed with the names of conspirators and supporters of bloody scenarios. And speaking of those who contacted you and were interested in what you were planning, who were they? Well, it's probably worth mentioning Vadim Prokopyev. I contacted him several times, spoke on the phone. I felt his ambitions, his desire to participate in the division of future power. But after talking with him, I got the impression that he was not serious, and I did not share any details of our plans with him, and our communication ceased. Did you assess the cost of eliminating the Belarusian president? What was the amount, the price of the issue? The price of the issue, according to our calculations, was about $10 million. This figure was derived as follows. On my assignment, the military, the group associated with DISOGSB, and the group associated with Pavel Kulishenko, who declared themselves street radicals, were to assess their expenses, how much money was needed to prepare and conduct their parts of the operation. All these amounts were added together, and the total was about $10 million. And I think this is a fairly realistic amount. Approximately, such a budget could indeed fit. Can you break it down by points? How much was allocated to whom in this calculation? How much to the military? How much to the radicals, the organizers, maybe? After three years, it's already difficult to remember specific figures, but roughly equal shares, about $3 million was supposed to go to the military, $3 million to radical groups, and $3 million to armed militants located in Belarus. And a million was left in reserve for unforeseen expenses. Another important component of these expenses was the so-called PR support meaning spreading information online, preparing public opinion for possible radical changes, something like an unexpected change of power in Belarus. And this also required expenses, because specialists in this field, propagandists, bloggers, etc., need to be paid. It's clear that you didn't have such money directly. With which foreign organizations, forces did you communicate in search of funding? We negotiated, sought funds in Ukraine, Israel, and the United States. Estimates were drawn up, which we passed to Alexander Perepechko, and he submitted an application and sent it by email to one of the U.S. military industrial complex corporations through Shigelsky, through Samuel Klieger, this American Jewish committee, we tried to find military personnel who would help in drafting documents, operational plans for the direct operation to seize power. I negotiated with Igor Kolomoisky, as we believed he was a Ukrainian oligarch investing in various risky projects, and he might participate in such a project. Dmitry Shigelsky negotiated with Israel, including seeking the opportunity to draft operational plans. For this, he involved 
former military personnel in case these funds were allocated. How would you later settle? Alexander Karapetchko gave a very simple layout. In such projects, state property, state enterprises are always the collateral. Accordingly, in case of a positive result and gaining power, the settlement with the financier would be through the privatization of state enterprises of the Republic of Belarus and transferring them into foreign hands. If the project succeeds, the corresponding property or interest in the territory of this country where these funds were invested, it goes into the ownership or somehow already well of the company that financed it. This is a typical channel through which such projects are financed. Regarding the military, you already started paying for their services long before everything. How did it happen in reality? The first amount I simply took out of my pocket and handed it to the officer I met during our meeting in Grodno. Then I was already abroad. Such an opportunity was not there. So I preferred to transfer money through caches. I had several acquaintances whom I asked, without telling them in detail why it was being done, to make a cache somewhere in the suburbs of Minsk. And after the money was in the cache, I passed the coordinates of this cache to the officer, who then took it from there. For example, it was a forest in Kurapati, a cemetery in the Pukovichi district, abandoned construction sites in the direction of Rakov and Volozhin districts, and similar places. As far as I remember, there were seven or eight caches. Listen, you also had two very interesting lists. For example, Organizations that, according to Feduda, needed to be occupied within the next two minutes after the coup, starting from the presidential administration to the KGB. And another list where there were already people who were supposed to, well, be sent after Lukashenko in the first place. It was called internment. But in the same stream, Feduda says, learn to read between the lines. What did that mean? Feduta and Grigory Kostusev were on the territory of Belarus at that time, and he naturally feared that this information could fall into the hands of the State Security Committee, which would mean automatic arrest for him. Let's speak frankly. The people listed in this list are the top officials of the state, and accordingly, without capturing or eliminating them, it is impossible to take power into one's own hands. Internment means, in general, detention without trial and investigation for an indefinite period. Until the ruling, let's call it again by its name, Junta, until it considers it necessary to keep these people in custody. How long can this last? It can last weeks, months, years, it varies. If the people listed in this list resisted, naturally, the army uses military methods. That just means a bullet to the forehead. Who compiled this list and why, for example, were Kachanova Eismont Markov included? Why Kachanova was included is clear, I think. She is the number two person. If something happens to the current head of state, he cannot perform his duties personally. Acting duties are assumed by Ms. Kachanova. As for Eismont and Markov, I asked Alexander Vasilievich Feduta, the author of this list, such a question. He said they are smart, talented propagandists, and such people at large can be dangerous. Didn't such questions arise? Why was this one included and someone else not? Were the names discussed at all? The names were discussed. The Duda acted as the person who knew the Belarusian elites best, so there was definite trust in his list. But if there were any other suggestions, the list would likely have been supplemented. As far as I remember, no additions were made. In this list, Besides the already mentioned Natalia Kachanova, there were also Prime Minister Roman Golovchenko, KGB Chairman Mr. Turtel, Defense Minister Renin, the President's Press Secretary Eismont, the current Minister of Information Markov, and other people I don't remember now. How would your group have divided power if it had indeed fallen into your hands? All power in the Republic of Belarus was to be in the hands of seven people three military, four civilians. Within this collective president, 
consisting of seven people, the powers were divided as follows. Each was to receive control over one of the regions of Belarus, and each member of the seven was to oversee a specific direction. Alexander Feduda, for example, planned to oversee electoral law reform and the media. The military was to be entrusted with the social sphere, as we believed the military was good at these issues. I was to oversee law enforcement reform and constitutional and electoral system reforms. We need to create, excuse me, at least the appearance of democracy during this period. We don't understand what will happen with the courts, with the parliament, with state media, and so on. That illegitimacy and illegitimacy, the winner in principle doesn't worry, right? Which winner? Well, what difference does it make to them, whether it's legitimate or not? In your assessments, in your company of like-minded people, who was more eager for power and who was more interested in the material question? Money. Well, probably Dmitry Shigelsky was more eager for power, who wanted to head the Belarusian KGB and control, including this ruling elite. And regarding money, well, it never clearly sounded, but it seems to me that Igor Makar was more interested in money than anything else. Because I'm not going to participate in removing Sasha just for a banker to come and kick me out and all the military involved to be imprisoned. Half a year will be too late to decide. Half a year will decide us. I remember when the events in Belovetskaya Pushcha happened, Yeltsin called George Bush Sr. and Shushkevich called Gorbachev. If you had taken power, were you planning to call any leaders of certain countries? The first call should be to the powerful of the world. Accordingly, this is to Washington, Brussels, Beijing. This is in the first hour after taking power. In your plan, officials and security forces were given six hours to swear allegiance to the new power? What would happen to those who didn't? There was even a stricter wording. Within six hours, they had to appear at their place of service or work. Those who didn't would deal with the military. This means immediate detention and in case of resistance, elimination. Did you predict probable scenarios of events after you came to power? not only positive for you, but also negative. We calculated that if the army was on our side, there was a 9 out of 10 chance we would win. But 1 out of 10 was a possible scenario, a civil war, a clash between security forces in the city, possibly even foreign intervention from any side. I also want to ask, in your plan, there was a point to block the energy system in Belarus. Was this some kind of blackout in case of necessity, meaning no light, electricity, internet to blind the country? There was such a group associated with Pavel Kulijenko, who called themselves cyber partisans. They declared they had the ability, through the internet, through server blockade, to block electricity supplies throughout Belarus or in a specific region. The question was considered to block mobile communication and power supply in the Starshinsky town area in the head of state's residence area. By the way, what were your plans for reorganizing the country? What deadlines did you set for yourself? And by what methods? Ideally, the plan I developed provided for five years of authoritarian rule, starting with a strict dictatorship and gradually transferring power to civilians and the military, leaving for barracks after five years. But initially, power must be strict. And it's not that I'm a supporter of strict power, but for quick and radical reforms, strict power is always justified and is a good tool for implementing the reforms planned by the ruling elite. Detention in Moscow. Do you remember that day now? What thoughts were in your head? What were you thinking about? Yes, of course, I remember that day very well. I replayed it many times in my head, analyzing what happened that day at different times, in different locations. But from the very detention, I remember clearly that the main thought was Belarusians or Russians. If it's Belarusians, I assessed it as death because I thought they would just take me to the forest and shoot me there. If it's Russians, 
Then I hoped for help from the American Embassy, that maybe I could somehow get out of it. And it was even visible in the operational detention video when I shouted, I asked a very simple question, Who are you? When they said police, I relaxed a bit because I decided it was probably Russians, so maybe there's still a chance to live a little longer. How much, remind me again, were you sentenced to? Well, to date I've already spent 3.5 years in places of deprivation of liberty. I still have nine years left. But I still hope that I won't be behind bars until the end of the term. I am a U.S. citizen. Since the summer of 2021, I haven't heard from U.S. representatives trying to contact me. I understand that the Biden administration has done absolutely nothing in these three and a half years. And tell me, did representatives of the U.S. intelligence services come to you in the U.S. with an offer to cooperate? I remember it like it was yesterday. Morning, a knock on the door. I open it. Three people are standing on the doorstep, almost like in a movie, two show FBI IDs. Department for the Protection of the Constitutional Order? The third didn't show any ID. One can guess it was someone connected with the CIA, as it has no right to work independently in the U.S. With a request to talk. Well, I invited them in. They went to the conference room where we met clients up. And the first question was, we have information that you work for the KGB. I said, no, I don't work. Are you ready to take a lie detector test? I said, if necessary, I will. And how do you feel about the offer to work for the government? I asked the U.S. government. Yes. Now, three years later, looking at those events, at your participation in them, how do you assess them? Do you admit your guilt? Undoubtedly, what I tried to do 3.5 to 4 years ago was a mistake, a serious mistake for which I paid and continue to pay my price. It's very unpleasant to be in places of deprivation of liberty when you only observe the sunrise and sunset through a narrow slit. Without the opportunity to lead a normal life, without the opportunity to engage in your professional activities from morning to evening, at best, it's only reading books. At best, conversations with cellmates. It's a very painful, very sad experience for me. On the other hand, I also understand that our experience, or rather, the lack of experience in management activities, could and most likely would not have been enough to prevent the country from sliding into the war that is now ongoing to the south of us in Ukraine. None of us had experience comparable to Lukashenko's in negotiations. And Lukashenko has done a brilliant job over the past two years preventing Belarus from being drawn into the war. This is undoubtedly his plus. And I'm not ashamed to say this, although everyone knows me as a critic of the current government, but I always give credit to my opponents. In this case, Lukashenko did a very good job, because if we had come to power, we almost certainly would not have been able to avoid dragging Belarus into the war. And when a shell arrives, it doesn't ask about political views. It doesn't ask if you're for the West or the East, for the North, or the South, it just kills. The only way to prevent a shell from arriving is to maintain peace in the country and keep it away from any international and internal conflicts. In this regard, I once again admit my guilt. I apologize to Alexander Grigoryevich Lukashenko for what I tried to do, and I would like to take this opportunity to ask him to pardon me and allow me to return to my family, to my loved ones in the United States, to return to my professional activities. And also, since I am a U.S. citizen, I would like to appeal to the U.S. presidential candidates, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, to facilitate my speedy return to the United States, to the state of Texas, the city of Houston, where my family resides to this day. In the history of our country, there have already been attempts 
at a violent change of the constitutional order. Meanwhile, the plans hatched by the so-called Zinkovich group have unprecedented scale and cynicism. In the history of independent Belarus, the murder of the head of state, members of his family, kidnapping and torture of people, assault on strategically important objects, external interference in the country's energy system activities, the criminals were not interested in the opinion of ordinary citizens. Essentially, they allowed for civil war, the death of civilians. They were only interested in one thing, power, especially since even at the stages of plan implementation, positions in the highest echelons of the future so-called power were already divided. In the activities of intelligence services, there is an axiom. If a terrorist reaches the stage of executing a terrorist act and does not fall into the field of view of intelligence services, the likelihood of committing a terrorist act increases significantly and can reach 70%. Regarding the Zinkovich group, intelligence and counterintelligence agencies acted preemptively. Essentially, a military coup with all its attributes was prevented. With the deployment of heavy armored vehicles on the streets of Minsk, the death of civilians, and as a result, the establishment of a military dictatorship. It is noteworthy that the president was chosen as the object of the conspiracy because he is the main active link, the backbone of the entire power system in the Republic of Belarus. And of course, the bet is on destabilizing the power system, the management system, leading the Republic into chaos. Nothing reasonable, nothing positive in the development of this conspiracy will happen. It is proposed what is being discussed. What does Zinkovich say? That the property of the Republic of Belarus will be privatized, given away for plunder, that Belarusian Shubais and Gaidars will emerge, and as a result, we will be left with nothing. And the result of this chaos will be pushing the Republic of Belarus where? To the Ukrainian scenario, and we will get civil war, terror, extremism, and complete hopelessness of our further existence, possibly even as a state. We cannot allow this. Belarusians, citizens, must unite around the common idea of protecting the constitution, territorial integrity, and independence of the republic. Trust your president. Watch about this on YouTube. Films kill the president. Details of the assassination attempt on Alexander Lukashenko hot on the trail. Mankurts about betrayal by their own and foreign intelligence services. Terror 2021. The attempt by radicals Dennis Dis Hoffman to blow up Belarus from within. And also the TNT of protest about the terrorist acts of Nikolai Avtokovich's gang.